Hey guys, what's up? Week 112, happy 4th of July. And just to let you know, the contest for the American Horror Project Volume 2 is still going on. So if you want to enter, just send an email over to ScreamingToiletContest at gmail.com for a chance to win this bad boy, reviewed a couple weeks ago. Has three flicks in there, all pretty cool, interesting regional American horror films. The Child, Dark August, and uh, Dream No Evil. All cool stuff. You also get a tote bag, so you can't beat that. Also, for all the uh, patrons out there for my Patreon, uh, I'll draw this for next week for the June Patreon prize for Brain Damage Arrow release. No slipcover, unfortunately, but the price on Amazon was too cheap to pass up. So, uh, yeah, if you want to join the Patreon, links will be below. You can get me to watch a movie every month. You can get me to do a commentary on a movie of your choice. And uh, you can do a whole show. You can do all sorts of things. So if you're interested, it's it's all information below. So let me hop into the first review. And this is from Severn Films. This is The Beast in Heat. This is a video nasty. And uh, this is one I actually hadn't seen. I think I had a DVD from like Exploitation Digital or Media Blasters or somewhere like that. But yeah, uh, The Beast in Heat. Man, I put this in. And, uh, you know, I've seen some Nazi exploitation movies before, uh, in particular Ilso, which is kind of a classic exploitation movie. And this is freaking gross. This is, and, and it's one of these movies that's played completely straight. At points, I was like, this is nonsense. This is completely ridiculous. And I was laughing. I would explain this film in the way that when I wasn't holding down my puke, I was chuckling in between. So that, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, equal parts repulsive and ridiculous is definitely what I would call this movie. So The Beast in Heat, it kind of follows a lot of these similar stories. They all have a kind of storyline where these Nazis are performing experiments on, uh, you know, women and men and torturing them. A lot of sadist, uh, you know, sad, uh, sa you know, sadistic stuff going on here and weird kind of experiments of torture that really obviously <laughs> they're not just doing it because they're sick. So the the lead baddie in here is definitely coming from the Ilsa approach. Uh, she's actually chewing the scenery and seems to be having a great time. And I actually enjoy her performance, although over the top. Everyone's dubbed. The dialogue is ex absolutely ridiculous. There is a group of uh, Italians that are fighting against the Nazis and they're kind of an underground group. And there's a lot of the stories, half the story is them trying to figure out how to stop the Nazis and being discovered by the Nazis and getting gunned down and shooting Nazis. And the other half takes place in this kind of experiment torture room where we just see a bunch of naked people being whipped and, you know, all sorts of nasty things and are, are implied. And they're shown, but it, it not it, in graphic detail, but it, the special effects are always great. For instance, there's a, and this is all played straight. It, it's no tongue in the cheek here. They don't, it's no, no camp. They, I don't know how you would define camp or tongue in cheek. Maybe it's both, but these people did not know how stupid this was. So, you know, the definition argument of camp and tongue in cheek, it's just kind of all over the place sometimes. But regardless, this is a very straightforward, played, serious movie, which makes it kind of f funny at times. Although it is disgusting, like I said, and strangely heartfelt towards the end of the movie, which kind of surprised me. But there's a scene where um, they, you know, the old trick where they say in like Graveyard Shift where they, uh, what Brad, Brad Dwarf says about them uh, putting a wound on your leg and uh, putting some sort of thing on top of it and putting a rat inside there and heating it up so the rat has no way but to dig down. They do that in this one. But um, it's supposed to be rats, but when they pull it off, it's just these two adorable guinea pigs that are not threatening at all. They don't try to cover it up, and they're just, like, covered in fake blood like this. Just looking around, it's really funny. And there, there's a moment where someone's getting their fingernails torn off, and they're screaming in agony, and the dub over says, you're hurting me. Stephen Thrower mentions all this in his interview on here, which I really like to see. And I was saying the same thing at the when I was watching this. I, I could not stop laughing at stuff like that. And then I'd be disgusted when they have people being whipped, and, you know, there's castration. It, have you ever seen a Nazi exploitation movie without castration? I don't think so. Um, so, you know, of course, the, the lead baddie does that. But the one that makes this stand out the most to me is um, there's an actor in this he's in a couple westerns i've seen spaghetti westerns and he's like a shorter guy and he has some sort of um you know deficiency like um a, a, a physical defect where he's really short but also like muscular and stocky and they have him kind of dressed up to be some sort of mongoloid like creature and they have him in a cage and they're trying to make the master race and what he is is just this kind of a uh, rapey dwarf and whoever gets thrown in the cage he rapes and molests them non-stop and there's a scene where he goes down um kind of spoilers i don't know how much you can spoil all of this movie where he bites off somebody's uh um vaginal hair their pubic hair and uh i was thinking geez 
this is just so disgusting. And then we'll cut to over, go into like the, uh, um, you know, the military style parts. It's like an Italian, you know, military action movie. Not like as good as Inglorious Bastards, but they cut in this old footage of another movie he used of explosions and things like that. Um, I laughed quite a bit during the action stunts. Um, there's a guy, he does a somersault and catches a gun, and it's just like, what the hell is he doing here? Um, it looks pretty good and sounds pretty good. It's vastly entertaining, and it was more entertaining than it should have been for me. I don't know what it says about me, because I was getting disgusted and repulsed, but at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, that was so much fun, but also really gross and disturbing. I don't know what is wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. Send help. But uh, I enjoyed it vastly. I do come from that time when I really liked the 70s exploitation movies and I, I have a fondness for the video nasties in general and this is one of the ones I hadn't seen so it was really great to see Severn putting this out uh, the thing that really makes this release worth getting is besides the 30 minute Stephen Thrower appreciation is an hour and a half uh, documentary about Nazi exploitation movies and I, that's a documentary I've never seen anybody cover they have interviews with old directors filmmakers uh, directors of photography on it experts they dive deep they have Ilsa herself on there Diane Thorne and her husband husband and they talk about everything from French uh, Nazi exploitation movies. They talk about the artsy ones like Night Porter. It's really interesting. It's really well done. It's better than the movie as far as um, if you're looking for some sort of like substantial filmmaking is concerned. But I enjoy both, and together they make a great package. I would really recommend checking this uh, release out. I had a lot of fun with it. And uh, on the other, if it's uh, The Beast and Heat's not your thing, the Nazi exploitation documentary will certainly be your thing. Uh, it's funny, because nowadays as you get older, it's like, uh, you gotta have your vegetables with your meat and uh it's like yes i need to have like if that makes any sense to everybody you have you have like your entertainment piece and then you're like i need my health i need i need something in context to make this whole thing come together and i enjoy that I, you know i like to learn about film just as much as i like to watch film if that makes any sense but great release from severin uh the links will all be below and there should be a written review on the screaming toilet we knew all along that you and your sister were playing a double game. So you're still able to look upon me as a woman, eh? <laughs> ah, Stefano Paler. Did you know we've also got your little fiancé here? You're just a bitch on hate. How do you find the experiment? Excellent. I think you're a genius. You're wonderful, Dr. Crash. How a person with some personal elegance and intelligence ends up making a movie as repellent and 
tasteless and shocking and disgusting as Beast in Heat is a, a mystery. Il peggio del peggio. Perhaps my generation was more judgmental, so they would say, how could you do that film? Il divertirmi a farmi certi, a fare certi personaggi, perché sono personaggi che sono al contrario della, della mia indole. Who the hell is it calling at this hour? At your service, General. Okay, the next one is from Severn Films 2, and I reviewed this one before, but it was on Amazon Streaming. Finally, got a Blu-ray release. I know we were all like, we want this. Robo War from Bruno Mattei. Um, you know, like Shocking Dark or Terminator 2, which he did was a ripoff of Aliens and um, Terminator. So now, what's a better way to do Robocop and Predator? Robo War, starring some very familiar faces. Red Brown, yes, we all know Red Brown from Big Wednesday and some other things like the 70s Captain America. This is a hugely a Predator ripoff. We have a group of guys who are all hired to go on this uh, mission. And of course, they're double-crossed. They're really there to uh, see how they face off against this high-tech robot, uh, you know, robot man thing, Robocop, basically, in the jungle. Um, yeah, it has a lot of the similarities that everything else has. The dialogue, although nearly not as good, but partially ripped off, just like they did in um, Shocking Dark. I like this one quite a bit more than Shocking Dark, and revisiting it and seeing it in HD and everything helped push it along. I enjoyed the score. Uh, the cheesiness is a blast, but... What really made this release work, again, was all the special features they added on here. Unfortunately, Red Brown is not interviewed on here, which kind of bummed me out. I think Red Brown, Red Brown's still alive, as far as I know. But, uh, yeah, they interviewed a couple people I've never seen interviewed. Catherine Hicklin, who plays uh, Virgin in the movie, which is a really weird name for a character in a movie. Uh, Jim Gaines and uh, John, I can't think of his last name, and Massimo Vanni, who's the stunt coordinator. And, of course, uh, the co-director, writer, co-writer, uh, Claudio Forgrasso, and uh, his wife, uh, Drew, Judy, I think her name is Ros Rosalini Drudy. Regardless, the, it seems that Severance had a really good inner, um, you know, a relationship with these two, and they've interviewed them for Shocking Dark and Other Hell and a whole bunch of other stuff, and I get to see this progression with the two uh, when their releases come out, and I, I really like them. I've, gained, I've, you know, grown to really enjoy their interviews and, you know, their take on things, but these people, they talk about the movie, they know what it is. They know it's cheesy and it's fun, and uh, the guy who played Bray, uh, John, John, I can't think of his last name, he had so much insight. He knew exactly exactly what it was. He was like, yes, it's silly. Yes, it's dumb. But, you know, it, it deserves kind of to be a cult classic and it's fun. It's funny. And, and, you know, I can't, who am I to tell people not to like it? And they all seem to come at that kind of that way. And I never seen Jim Gaines and interviewed, which is great. He's also in Zombie 4 After Death. So I was like, yes, this is really interesting. And I get, uh, there's also a behind the scenes look. Uh, of Christine Hicklin's, uh, you know, behind the scenes footage she shot while she was there. And you can like see the stuff they're saying in the interviews and then you can reflect it into the behind the scenes, how they all didn't like this one guy named Mel, uh, how he was kind of a weird person, didn't was very, you know, standoffish. And uh, just the idea of shooting in the Philippines. I, I never actually watched the documentaries about the Philippines. What was it? Machete uh, Maidens and the other one. I think there's two of them. So seeing like the, you know, behind the scenes on the Philippines movies was really interesting at the same time. And it just seemed like hell, to be honest. Just because of the humidity for me. I can't stand the humidity. But regardless, this movie's a blast. It is a Predator ripoff. It is a Robocop ripoff. There's some laugh out loud moments. And they talk about how they forced Red Brown to constantly scream when he was shooting. And he didn't want to do that. Nothing but nice things to say about Red Brown on the special features. Everybody said he was a genuinely nice guy, easygoing guy. And I, I, was, I got that impression from him. I see, he was at Cinema Wasteland one year. And I, I didn't get his autograph. I just walked by. And I was just like, because it was like you come and you, one person's got to pass another. I nodded and moved to the side and he was like hey, he seemed like a really nice guy and that's all I have I don't know why I told the story but I, I really enjoyed the release itself like I said it's a fun movie it's never dull there's a decent amount of action there's nonsense the robot looks terrible he does not look particularly good oh my god I forgot Romano Pupo's in this movie too and uh, Massimo Vanni's in a bunch of other stuff too but Romano Pupo is a very familiar face and I'm sure I mentioned this in my previous review but he's in stuff like Ghoulies 2 uh, Street Light he's in everything to be honest he's in The Last Shark I think this guy has been in every Ita every other Italian movie I've seen. So uh, I like the gang. Actually, it's a nice like ensemble cast of all these people. And there's some funny like mistakes in here at the end of calling Red Brown Murphy. They call him Murphy in the credits, and they switch uh, Jim Gaines and I think Romano Popo. They switch their characters' names, and you're just like, oh geez, come on, guys. But 
vastly entertaining, really laugh out loud moments, but it is pretty action packed, although it is not the most well made movie, but it's made on a cheap budget and you can see a lot of it works. It's never boring. Uh, it's, it's shameless in its rip off at times. Uh, I also, like I said, the special features really make this release uh, and seeing Drudy's career, they do a Drudy uh, retrospective on her and she talks about, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing her last name. I'm terrible with names. You guys know that, but they talk about how she started off. She talks about how she started off writing for 10 years being taken advantage of no credits or anything like that and she's kind of got screwed over by the producers of the movies not paying her union dues so that's all interesting and it's kind of nice to see you know how you know some of the italian writers were treated not nice it's 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 a nice insight into seeing it and it's unfortunate what happened to her but you know she got she's finally getting some credit and i like seeing that and um you know these two they, for grasso and her they know what they made and they appreciate the fans and they don't have a problem talking about it but they're not like these people that are like it's the greatest film ever made they understand it's cheesy and, and at certain points you know what i mean but and they, they laugh at the same things everybody else laughs at about the movie you know they had no control over the robot sounds that uh robot war guy makes but but there's of course a twist in here too but that uh you know somebody inside there's no there's no coincidence obviously that the lead character's name murphy and it's a ripoff of robocop but you know it's you know, that you know, the twist isn't going where you think but regardless a very fun movie a very nice release from seven films and look for a written review on screaming toilet here we have corporal neil corey top marksman rating private larry garino alfred bray dubbed papa duck Sonny Peel, martial arts expert. His friends call him Blood. Quang, forward scout and point taker. And this is our coordinator, Major Murphy Black. Enemy sighted, moving target, three sheet. On target, on target, on target, fire. Start settling some accounts here. Major, this belonged to Lieutenant Woodring. Remember him? <laughs> On target, on target, on target. <laughs> They didn't speak English, I didn't speak Italian, we did a lot of this. We all knew on the set that it was a rip-off, that's what Bruno often does. Well, there's no problem with that, the Italians are great at it. He fainted twice because it was so hot. <laughs> 
We had to throw him in the water. <ride> I primi piani stretti che funzionano bene. A me sono fatta un sacco di risate e ho detto forse è per quello che piace tanto perché non riuscivo a capire. Okay, this next one's pretty interesting to me. This is from Arrow Video, and this is L The Loveless, or just Loveless. Yeah, The Loveless, starring Willem Dafoe, directed by Catherine Bigelow. Now, I hadn't seen this movie, to be honest. I I'd heard the name in passing, and I never got a chance to check it out. First and foremost, I want to say this movie looks spectacular. It's a gorgeous-looking movie. Um, it, uh, it, Like I said, it's co-directed by Catherine Bigelow. And, uh, you know, she did Near Dark and Blue Steel and some other films, of course, obviously. And this has got to be one of Willem Dafoe's earliest roles, his first starring role. This kind of takes, this takes place in the 50s, and it's like a look back at the 50s. Willem Dafoe is kind of one of the leaders of this motorcycle gang. They kind of race, and they're on their way cross country, and they kind of stop in, I think, like middle America to fix their bikes and be on their way. But, uh, of course, there's this, like, underlying, like, violence of where it's like, this whole movie to me. It like fetishizes the 50s, like the Coke machines, the, the, the way everybody's dressed in their leather and stuff. It's just almost like a, a, a pornographic calendar of the 50s brought to life, if that makes any sense. Softcore, I should say. Like You could tell that the filmmakers just were madly, madly infatuated with the 50s, but at the same time, they want to show it in a beautiful kind of like, you know, light like that. But then there's this underlining violence and dread coming. Kind of reminded me of like a little bit like, you know, I don't want to say blue velvet, but it, you know, like, you know, it's coming and you know, something's not exactly right. So, uh, Willem Dafoe starts this kind of relationship with this young girl who has kind of like, um, you know, she has a bad reputation and her father is a real scumbag sleazeball. And you, you learn later on that they're, their father daughter, and there's obviously something going on between them. So, uh, which is very unsettling, but I, I don't know how to get into this. The movie doesn't have an amazingly in-depth plot. It's really about these 50s bikers stopping in in this small town and kind of disrupting it and something obviously violent going to happen at the end. You just know it's one of these movies where you know something bad's going to happen at the end. You don't know how many people are going to get hurt, but you know there's going to be blood. So that's kind of what I'll go with. Uh, I felt that it was pretty interesting. William Dafoe was a decent actor. I thought a lot of the dialogue was, uh, you know, it felt very 50s, but some of the actors could not deliver it very well. I thought the acting was very weak, which surprised me. And then when I watched the special features, it made complete sense to me because they weren't actors. They were kind of part of that scene, part of that, like, I guess, rockabilly scene where they were, you know, more into bikes and music than actually acting. They really weren't actors. So that, that plays kind of a part right there. And Willem Dafoe is obviously the standout, very memorable uh, actor and character in it. But like I said, the movie to me was kind of just bothering me with its acting and everything like that. I just thought the, the uh, lead alongside Willem Dafoe was just very poor. And it, it, like I said, it made sense that he wasn't an actor. So, he, you know, I don't want to be nitpicky about that. But the acting was probably the weakest part of the movie. And you would never think a movie starring Willem Dafoe directed by Catherine Bigelow. The weakest part would be the acting. Um, like I said, it's a gorgeous movie to look at. The set designs are perfect. It's shot really well. There's nothing wrong with it in that aspect. And it's very enjoyable that way. And by the end of the movie, it really kind of won me over in a way. And I ended up enjoying the whole thing. But like I said, it is kind of a weird world and a weird kind of tone and everything about it. But like, it is interesting for sure, and you get to see a lot, you know, like, you get to see a lot about this small town, just how the people interact with each other and where they end up all in the same place at night, you know, small town, not much to do kind of deal, but, and they obviously have this, you know, hatred towards somebody that's different, like the bikers and whatnot, uh, but they end up being dangerous, so hey, uh, not unprovokedly dangerous, but dangerous nonetheless. So the special features on here include a commentary with uh, not Catherine Bigelow, but the other co-director, Montgomery. I can't think of his name right off the top of my head. But it also has interviews with Willem Dafoe, which blew my mind. Uh, the uh, the other lead who plays the rock, who's the rockabilly singer, and uh, two of the actors in the movie too. So we get this, it's all cut up, these four people talking. And they all have like different tones and different ways to tackle the interview. Willem Dafoe seems to be more analytical and relaxed. And uh, the rockabilly guy seems to be kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, kind of relax in the same way and then the other two are done together and they're just they're just like balls of energy it was kind of uh, weird to have all four of them cut together and it would cut to like Willem Dafoe like yeah and then talking about it seriously and then it would cut to those two and they were just like making jokes and everything like that not necessarily a bad thing but just definitely a difference in uh, you know the interviews I think it's a nice release and it was definitely an interesting movie I would watch it again and I would definitely take stills from this movie to show you know good set design stuff like that it's just it's a very good looking movie and it's one that I probably Probably would want to revisit just to see how I actually feel about it 100%, but it's good stuff. You know, now, I didn't love it, but I liked it. 
Here they come, as tough as they come. The Loveless. Which way are you coming from? It don't matter which way I'm coming from. It's which way I'm going to. I know I could send you to heaven. I don't want them in here, and I don't want to serve them. Like the town? They're animals. They're a bunch of commies. <laughs> We're going nowhere. Fast. If this keeps up, the gang's going to have to leave town. If there's any town left to leave. We'll be right in the neighborhood. The Loveless. Hope you don't live where they're going next. Okay, the next one is from On Earth Films, and this is part of their On Earth Classics line, and this is The Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, their first On Earth Classic was The Unnameable. The Dark Side of the Moon is a movie I actually had the freaking tape for like 20 years, and I never watched the thing. It was always sitting on my shelf. So when this was announced it was getting released, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm really interested in checking that out. I put this in, and the first thing I noticed is a couple familiar faces, one of which I noticed is Dean Halsey from The Reanimator. I was like, who is that? And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's Dean Halsey, because I actually think Dean Halsey gives probably the most underrated performance in Reanimator. I really loved Reanimator and the acting and everything, but Dean Halsey, he he, everybody's good in it, but he he's just underrated performance, I think. So Dark Side of the Moon here. Okay, this is definitely a sci-fi kind of aliens kind of deal, and this is a movie that always everybody said, you know, it starts off as a space horror movie, but it ends up being a horror movie about the Bermuda Triangle, which is the case, and it is pretty and pretty insane to think about. So we have this group of, uh, I guess, what are they? Um, I don't want to say miners. I can't remember exactly what their job is, but uh, they're, um, you know, maybe they're uh, scientists of some sort. But they get caught in between this spot and the moon and the earth, and all their systems shut down. Their oxygen's going to run out everything's gonna run out and uh, they see this other old school space shuttle floating up to them that it looks like an old model so they decide to attach to it and see if it works and try to bring in the air from that ship into this ship and uh, pretty soon they realize something's not right there's some sort of weird thing on the ship and it's all done like there's a lot of triangle symbolism and they find a body on the ship with a hole in its chest which is a perfect triangle they do not know how the incision was made and they find out that it's just it's perfect there's no way that a human instrument could have done it so it sets up the tone of the this movie and then there's a lot of going back and forth between the ships figuring out who's possibly bad and good and whatnot john Dahl's also in this i reviewed mo money last week he played the bad guy in this john dale Dahl. how do you say his name i think it's deal deal so he's in this one as well so the characters are fairly well established in here and uh they're decent but the lead is probably the weakest, I think, especially when you have guys like Dean Halsey and John Deal in here. So I thought they were probably the strongest. Uh, and you have a lot of like people kind of arguing who's who, what's going on. So, and I did kind of notice there's some similarities between Event Horizon. I don't know, go, attaching to the ship and everything seems to be not as, not obviously not hell, but well, kind of actually, but I don't want to spoil too much. So it doesn't exactly feel like Event Horizon, but it definitely is a precursor to Event Horizon. Not as well done, I would say. But I thought the acting, like I said, was fairly solid. I, I like most of the characters and actors in the movie. The lead is the weakest. He's not horrible, though. Um, the gore is there when it happens. It's pretty nasty, especially what comes out of the, the little triangle thing was pretty cool. I think that it does have decent atmosphere, and the set design is also nice. It, although this movie does seem to go on a little too long. Like, I caught myself being like, there's a lot of walking around. I wish this would wrap up. I, I lost interest a couple times, to be brutally honest with uh, with you guys. I, I it couldn't hold my interest the whole way what was happening. It just kind of started to drift, and it just become kind of a little boring for me. Uh, like I said, and the ending, you know, kind of was definitely a precursor to a lot of other things that came after. And the idea that a space horror movie turned into some sort of interdimensional Bermuda Triangle horror movie is cool to me. Uh, the concept is decent. It looks all right, actually. You know, I didn't know about this movie. I never actually saw it on VHS, so I couldn't compare. It sounded decent as well. Uh, there's some features on here, interview with uh, one of the actors and the special effects artist, and then there's a commentary with, uh, I believe, the director. So that's nice to see. You know, it's definitely an underseen movie. It's going to be some people's bag if they love space horror. I thought it was okay. I thought it was kind of mid-tier. Um, I was happy to watch it, though, 
and I thought that it was nice to see some, you know, familiar faces pop up in this as well. But it's okay. It's a dark side of the moon. Mayday. Mayday. We have lost all power. We are drifting towards Centrus B-40. In the darkness of space, an ancient power lives. Something's out there. It's coming right at us. Looks like the shuttle. Discovery from the old NASA program? The crew of Space Corps One has discovered its secret. Come on, that ship splashed down in the Bermuda Triangle 30 years ago. What's it doing up in space? Look at this. 666, the mark of the beast. Now, a scientific mission has become an exploration into the unknown. Give me 30 minutes. If I'm not back, Seal off the airlock. There's no coming back. Beyond rescue. There has never been any contact with alien life forms. Thus far. No! No one can hear you. Beyond reason. There's something inside of her. Beyond salvation. You let it out, didn't you? Who the hell are you? I control your destiny. And I will take what is mine. The dark side of the moon. Help is only 250,000 miles away. Okay, guys, this next one is from a company called Darkside Releasing, and this is The Black Forest. I'm not going to try to say its Brazilian name, but yeah, this is by a director. I'm going to say uh, Rodrigo Aragao. I'm, uh, hopefully I pronounced his name correctly. I had actually seen some of his other work. This guy has done a few movies, and this is the first one, as far as I know, it's been released in the States. He did a movie, Mud Zombies and The Black Sea and Night of the Chupacabras, all well worth seeing, all worth checking out. Um, these movies feel um, kind of like... The Brazilian horror and a lot of South American horror to me feels the closest to Italian and Spanish horror that I used to like to watch when I was younger and I still do like to watch. So The Black Forest, uh, this this follows the story of a, a poor girl and her parental figure, not really her father as you find out, but they live in the jungle and they kind of sell, you know, holistic stuff and herbs to help cure ailments. And in a marketplace, it feels really like, you know, backwoods and uh, very, very poor. And everybody in this area seems to be like that. They're all struggling kind of to get out of this area. And some tragic things happen. And she, she's really desperate. She ends up finding some, uh, uh, this man, this gold. And this guy's with the gold. And he says, just read this spell. Gives her this book. Read this spell at this time and don't read any other spells don't break the rules and you can keep the gold and everything will be okay so that that somewhat she follows the rules only to a certain extent of course she starts reading other spells people get killed that she doesn't want to get killed and she wants to get revenge and things go crazy there's all these different spells being put um the atmosphere is great it's it's very uh you know looks scary as hell because the jungle and the uh and the forest or whatever and it's just really you know all the shacks are built and uh, and stuff Stuff like that it's just you feel really bad for the good-natured people in this movie because the way they live and the, the you know how hard it is to live in this area and you feel bad for the lead in this movie but you want her to kind of lash out at points but there's some really crazy moments in this movie and at times you're like where's this going it feels like there's three or four subplots and it feels almost like an anthology you know and and, and then that's what uh, jeremy said when he was watching this feels like an anthology at times and i did see i did notice that too we have these storylines where she comes in contact with all these people she has this you know ex-lover and she has these two criminals that stole from her and then she has this this guy she comes in contact with who has a sick mother and a wife and him uh, his his wife and him do not get along they both are just out there and at their other's throats and his wife is pregnant and they're poor and all these stories are going on at the same time and of course they all come together and they all interact with her in this book this book kind of 
does uh, ruins everything to be honest but there's some great special effects all of it practical it gets really intense at the end and it, it leaves you wanting more at the end of this movie you're like i want to watch this movie now i love that this director will take these creatures he'll have these zombies or demons crawling out of the mud covered in mud and they remind me of something like giannotti de rossi would do for a fulci movie and i love that i adore that that look it's just what i like to see in horror movies especially when they're supernatural inspired and i love spells and movies especially when they kind of go some people compare it to evil dead but i don't really see it as like it is a book of the dead at times but you know it feels more italian inspired than anything and there's this great uh you know imagery of this uh these creatures or this guy stand there's like this grim reaper every once in a while that's like leading her kind of in a way i guess holding this giant sword at one point and she decides to do something to save the day which is really kind of intense but there's demons there's like these zombies there's uh crazy chicken monsters and it, it's to that point where it turns into like a peter jackson goofy splatter thing but the actors are playing it straight so it works perfect there's a weird cult in here that wants to book for themselves uh led by these this couple this preacher and his wife who are really good in it as well i just would really recommend this movie for something different if you want a slice of that old school you know italian or spanish euro whore that you used to get i feel like a lot of that stuff's coming out of um the south america right now and they're also doing some other things like trauma which was completely brutal and, and hidden in the woods and just stuff that made my jaw drop we are what we are so the original just some stuff that's really interesting and good and i think this director is vastly underrated and he he's one of these guys that really deserves a cult following in america i would say but and with stuff like mud zombies and out of the chupacabras the black sea i think that his stuff is well worth watching and uh well worth seeking out and i'll put some maybe if i can find some links to his uh, films below but i hope that they get united states releases here i'll put links below for this one at the very least but i really like to see this stuff get broader released it's really it's really well made and low budget good horror film and uh you know a lot of movies coming from other countries truly are just more they don't they feel like they're less you know they don't put their nose up to it they love it they you know i don't know how to explain it but i really do love my foreign whore and uh i'm digging this stuff from south america and this is one of them for sure there's a 20 minute making of and the director talks about you know if i didn't get to make movies with monsters and puppets and, and explosions and things like that i wouldn't want to make movies and it's just like this guy knows what it's all about man this guy knows what it's all about and i love that so uh check this one out i can't recommend it enough this is one of my favorite ones i've seen in a while Tô morrendo e vou pro inferno. Ninguém sabe quando vai morrer. Pode acreditar, eu sei. Tem uma missa nesse livro. Se for lida durante toda a noite, até o nascer do sol, minha alma será salva. Depois queima o livro. Não leia mais nada. Queima! Temos uma invocadora de demônios, uma adoradora do coisa ruim, irmãos, uma bruxa. Eu achei a senhora. Eu tô indo embora daqui pra nunca mais voltar. Você quer ir comigo? Os filhos dos homens retiram o sangue. Eu acho que não era um rato não, Zé. E fétido dos jardins da tua morada. Ai, demônio! Ofereço-te a pureza imaculada. Que o poder do oculto se manifeste através do sangue. Tira isso daqui, pelo amor de Deus. Ela que trouxe o demônio. Peguem ela, irmãos! Peguem! Vá! Vá! Me dê o que eu quero e volte para o mundo de onde veio! You know what the best way to follow up a Brazilian horror gore movie is? With um, How to Stuff a Wild Bikini.
Da, 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 da. Yes, <laughs> this is from Olive Films, and um, you know I, you know I, I request some things, and I actually didn't request this one, and it showed up just because I was like I don't know anything about bikini movies or beach movies or anything like that, and I'm gonna be completely out of my element here. This director also did Night Warning, which blew my mind. I was like he did Butcher Baker, Nightmare Maker, and How to Stuff a, a, a Wild Bikini. Okay, this movie, the cast had me one over right off the bat. I'm not going to lie. It is a musical and it took me about 15 to 20 minutes to get into it. When the people started breaking out in song and dance, it was just way too cheesy for me. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this, but the cast really won me over. We got John, uh, what is it? Uh, John Dunlovey from uh, Quatermass experiment in Quatermass two. Love him. Had Mickey Rooney, John Ashley, um, had a, a cameo by Jeannie. I dream of Jeannie, which is really fun. Who else is in here? A uh, Buster Keaton had a, a huge cast and I'm, I'm missing some people. I know that Len Lesser's in here. So the cast is big. The cast is huge. Frankie Avalon. So I was just like, okay, this is going to be fun. I know it will be. So I started watching it and it really feels like an episode of Gilligan's Island or I Dream of Genie, just like those cheesy things I would watch as a kid. And I'd be like, I don't know why I'm watching this. And then by the end of it, I'll be like, oh, I liked it. It's enjoyable. And that's exactly how I feel about this one. So I started watching it and like my eyes were rolling. And then after a while, I was into it. I love Mickey Rooney and uh, uh, John, uh, Don Lovey. Uh, the, their interactions are are really funny and uh, great. The plot is insane. Okay, uh, Frankie Avalon is, uh, you know, away at the Navy base. I think he's in uh, Hawaii or somewhere really nice. And he's kind of dating this girl there and he has a girl back home and he doesn't want his girl dating anyone. Well, even though he's basically cheating on her, you know, double standards, especially back in the 60s. So he did, he wants his girlfriend to be true. So he goes to Buster Keaton, who is this, you know, the big, you know, head honcho guy on the island. Completely ridiculous character in this movie. And he uh, sends this, this bird after to watch him and uh, he gets torpedo juice to try to, send this really beautiful girl to distract all the men so none of the men will go after his girlfriend it's really convoluted it's really silly in the meantime mickey rooney is trying to find the perfect american couple to ride their motorcycles cross country and win the race so we have this wacky race thing going on too so mickey rooney and don lovey are always constantly involved with this rooney's really funny and really cheesy and just silly he has a lot of charisma. I'm not going to lie. A lot of good screen presence. He's funny. So he basically tries to stop, you know, uh, get this girl who he, um, everybody's falling in love with to do the race. But of course, you know, the guy who he chose to do the race, the all American boy is in love with Frankie Avalon's girlfriend. So we have this whole crazy love thing going on. And also not to mention there's a biker gang and the biker gang is led by this really goofy guy who's really clumsy and always screws up. And he has his eye on the, you know, the imaginary girl that Buster Keaton created as well so he wants to be the guy to date her at the end of the movie they end up having a wacky ridiculous race with lots of gags and goofy things happening in it there's good moments there's some funny moments i laughed out loud len lesser steals a show if you guys don't know who len lesser is he pops up in the outlaw josie wales blood and lace and what else is he in uh death hunt i think he's in he said he's uncle leo from seinfeld for everybody else but he's just really creepy and over the top and just evil and just cheesy made me laugh quite a bit actually some of the music numbers are actually well done, which surprised me. I do like, you know, silly gags where people are getting hit with stuff like, oh, walking into walls. It makes me laugh. I grew up watching the Three Stooges and Abigail Stella, stuff like that. So, you know, I like that kind of thing. Some people don't like slapstick. I love it, especially when it's clever. So I was really surprised. I was watching this and I was like, this is going to be a dumb piece of junk. You know, not for me, you know, because I don't, I thought it was going to be a strictly a bikini movie. I don't know anything about bikini movies. The beach bikini movies, the only time I get into them is when they're parodied, like Psycho Beach Party or stuff like that. But it's a, it's really enjoyable. I thought it looked pretty good. It sounded pretty good. There's subtitles. Um, I would watch it again. I would put it on for, you know, although, you know, some of the things are very dated and, you know, the dating practices are, you know, probably a little offensive to people in this movie. I would put it on maybe for a nice little family night or something like that. Something a little ill offensive, but very silly at the same time. So that's how to stuff a wild bikini. Really goofy. It's wild, man. Wild. Look and listen. 36, 22, 36. That's how you stop a wild bikini. I'm faithful, not dead.
I have a simple theory. If you're not with a girl that you love, love the girl that you're with. I got an A in biology. This picture's got everything. You better be ready when love comes swinging along. You better know the words to that familiar old song. man make heap good fire water. Get me. And I'm not even an Indian. Okay, the next one here is from Mill Creek Entertainment. It's a steel book of Mothra. Yes, a kaiju movie. You know, I used to watch these kaiju movies growing up, you know, Godzilla and stuff like that, and Godzilla vs. Sea Monster. I like that. You know, and I hadn't seen them in years, so I, I'm really kind of weak on these. I'm not up to date on them, and I haven't seen some of the classic classics like Mothra. But okay, so I put Mothra in. There's This has two versions. You can watch the English version, which has a commentary on there with experts, which is cool to hear, and a Japanese version, which is 11 minutes longer. I chose to watch a Japanese version, although I do like my Euro horror, like Span Spanish and Italian horror films dubbed in English because everybody speaks their native language on set. Anyways, I prefer my Japanese horror films or, you know, fantasy films in their native language just because the dubbing on those is so poorly done. Okay, Mothra. It's definitely in a world where these monsters exist. This was made years after Godzilla, I think six years, and it was its popularity basically got them to make more Godzilla movies, which is really awesome because otherwise we wouldn't have this huge franchise of a Godzilla film. So thank you, Mothra. So what we have here is uh, a group of people going on an island. There's a boat that sinks. It's caught between this island and radiation and a storm. And uh, every almost everybody dies. There's some survivors that end up on this uh, island that they think is inhabitable. Nobody lives on it. And come to find out, they said that the natives saved them on the island. So uh, they, a group of scientists and some other people, especially from a, a made-up country, which is, I guess, supposed to be a mixture of Russia and America, made-up country, go on this island, and they start to do some research um, to find out what's going on. One of the uh, lead characters who did a bunch of stuff, you'd recognize him right away. And a reporter sneaks along, too. So that's where we add this comic element where the reporter and his friend, the, the reporters are always doing silly things. And the reporter's actually the most likable character in it. Very, very funny. So that's where some slapstick elements in there, comic relief, come in. So they basically are on this island, and they discover this whole group of natives in some weird life, and these small little, they call them little beauties. And they're these, uh, like, one, one eighth or one eighth size people. They're like a foot tall, and they're these two twins who were actually played by like pop singers which is crazy and they uh you know they save them and they they communicate with singing of course the evil you know made up country i can't think what it's called like Ro rochations or something like that come back and kidnap the little singers and take them back to their country and they're going to make them perform or they take them back to japan and they're going to make them perform while everybody else wants to set them free and take them back to their island this upsets the god mothra or the people they the everybody worships this moth this egg and it turns out to be this caterpillar thing and it's after the tiny beauties to bring them back to their native the land. That's the setup for this movie. On the way, Mothra creates tons of damage, and they got to stop Mothra or return the beauties before all chaos breaks out while stopping the evil Nelson from the American-Russian ripoff country <laughs> from you know taking these little beauties away. So that's the plot of the movie. There's lots of miniatures. A lot of the miniatures are really great, really fun, really um, detailed, although sometimes with HD you can see that, that the little miniature people on the tanks are obviously... 
you know, just people. But it also has this element where like tons of destructions and tons of people are dying every second. And then there'll be like jokes and silly, funny things happening at the end. Like, oh, bye, Mothra. <laughs> but you know what I really liked about this movie is I really liked the monster Mothra because Mothra has no feelings. He's there just to do one thing or she's there just to do one thing. Rescue the little beauties. Anything in her way, you know, she's not, a, a, you know, a malignant character. She's not bad. So... She's just after to do to rescue her people, which makes sense. I like the design of Mothra when when there, it's like a um, caterpillar type, it looks great, and then when it turns into a moth, it's actually kind of a, a really pretty looking creature, and probably the sweetest kaiju looking monster I've ever seen. Like where you're like, oh, I just want to pet Mothra. Mothra's sweet. So uh, you know, I really enjoyed this. I didn't know what I was gonna think, especially considering the fact that Mothra really doesn't show up until 50 minutes in the halfway mark. But I thought that the colors were super vibrant on the island. I thought they looked great. I thought it was very fun. I like the fantasy element. Although people get mad when the natives are portrayed just as you know what you know natives are portrayed very very poorly in the 60s and 70s movies and even probably 80s. Some people would say Peter Jackson's movies too but hey um that's just how it goes and you know some people can't stand it some people can't watch it because of it i i i don't i you know i can watch them all you know but still i can understand what people are saying it doesn't bother me I'm sorry sorry if it you know bothers me that it, it doesn't bother it bothers you that it doesn't bother me but it's just a movie so yeah the moth for a whole detail and thing like that but i thought the island looked great you know it reminded me at the end of um not as violent of course but in the um coffin joe movies when uh, the second one it goes completely or is it the first one goes color and it's really vibrant like the whole island was like design like that reminded me of like Willy Walker's chocolate factory the whole jungle forest thing but they have these beautiful like you know things growing over obviously a statement on radiation the whole plot is kind of a rip from King Kong where they take something from the island but instead of that thing from the island rampaging something comes for them so we have Gorgo kind of style too it's been years since I've watched Gorgo I, I imagine this was made before Gorgo but you know it has the Gorgo King Kong style kind of deal uh, I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was really well made for what, you know, I, I'm not the biggest Kaiju fan, but I never hate when I watch them. You know, I enjoy them. And I thought Mothra was really kind of an excellent creature, an excellent movie. You know, it's really fun and good stuff. And it, it keeps you entertained. It has comic relief, has fighting in it. I hated the bad guys, was glad what they got. It definitely does the deal where people get shot. There's no blood. There's no squibs. It's fairly, you know, non-gory or anything like that. So you can show your family. But it's, it's just a cool little movie. I doubt your six-year-old might, might not want to read subtitles, although... It's probably best to get them on the subtitle movies as early as you can. But uh, good stuff from uh, Mill Creek and nice little hard box, you know. I mean, a uh, steel book. I'm not big on the steel books, but I don't mind them. And it has a little plastic slip cover over it too, so I like that. Oh, if you're gonna have a steel book, so it's all scratched up. But Mothra, good stuff. Remote Pacific Island, where an expedition of world famous scientists investigate incredible rumors of its fantastic mysteries and discover barren volcanic mountains surrounding strange green valleys. Mammoth caves that breed giant mutations. Vampire plants that devour humans. But most astounding of all, the tiniest women in all creation. Sacred beauties of a lost tribe which worships a monstrous creature. What is the secret of Mothra? What is the bizarre spell that awakens Mothra? As these doll-sized girls call to the super god from captivity. Mothra. Mothra, whose revenge is more devastating than any man-made weapon. Mothra, who defies warplanes. Wrecks ocean liners. Smashes dams and bridges. Mothra, creating hurricanes. Mothra, enveloped in a shell that no human force can penetrate. Mothra, indestructible, all-powerful, indescribable. What kind of creature is this god monster, Mothra? Okay, the next one. I just decided to watch this. I heard some good things about it. Is Leprechaun Returns. Yes! 
from Stephen Katansky, uh, one of the directors from the Astron 6 group, or he was, he also was a co-director on The Void. Um, yeah, I grew up watching the Leprechaun movies. I was born in 86, so in the early 90s when they were constantly hitting the video store, I would rent them and check them out and enjoyed most of them. And I stopped watching after Leprechaun in the Hood. After that, I didn't see any. And uh, I skipped the next couple sequels. And then I kept hearing good things about Leprechaun Returns. I saw the director and I was like, Okay, it's time to give this one a chance. Ten bucks, why not? So I put this in. All right, and it's a direct sequel to the original, which is similar vein that Halloween 2018 did, which I think is a good idea at this point because those storylines and all those the Leprechaun storylines never really matched up or made any sense, to be honest. So, okay, what we have here is a group of sorority girls. Uh, the lead girl was the daughter of uh, Jennifer Anson's character in Leprechaun. She's passed away, so she ends up going to this old house that she used to live at where the Leprechaun story happened. Her mom had, obviously, delusions of the creature for her life, so she seemed kind of low. Look, uh, people look at her as she might be mentally unstable. They want to start this green sorority, kind of funny, green leprechaun, you know, St. Patrick's Day, green sorority at the old house. She comes back, obviously, to, you know, I guess to face her mom's demons. There's some other people at the sorority too, really, you know, clean conscience people. Uh, and that's basically what happens here. They somehow resurrect the leprechaun. Ozzy's in here from the first one, played by the same actor. That was probably the coolest thing to see him come back in here. He plays kind of like this, uh, you know, cab driver, nice, sweet character, and he has an American werewolf in London thing going on later on in the movie, if you guys can catch my drift. But, yeah, let's get into this. The positives, the uh, effects are really good. Most of them are practical. They're gory, they're over the top, they're silly. Um, some of the characters are fairly well established. Some of them have some funny one-liners, and the two lead characters are three really, re I really enjoyed and really liked and was rooting for them to survive. The negatives, <sighs> It's really hard to replace Warwick Davis, and this actor, I know he did his best and his physical movements and everything like that, but I can't tell if it was the poorly written rhymes and dialogues and poems and limericks or whatever he was doing that hurt him, or it was his delivery, because I felt that all the limericks and the jokes and the one-liners he landed were very flat. And normally, I felt like Warwick Davis had this certain funness to them and i think that he really like owned up to it not saying this actor did poor i couldn't tell if it was his performance or the dialogue or just the writing so i was really iffy about him all around the whole movie but i thought he looked pretty good i thought that there was a decent amount of kills there wasn't a, a high high body count but probably pretty high for a leprechaun movie it was super gory i laughed quite a bit at times they do some cool decent gags and I like who survives in the movie. I was very pleasantly surprised that they didn't kill a character I really liked. And I was like, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Because so many times in these movies, it's always the lone survivor and that's it. But I was like, if we're going to continue this series, which I hope they do, why not? Why the hell not? Um, I'd like to see these characters return because I enjoyed them. Like, the characters in the movie are fairly stereotypical. We got the one who's like, I love film. And he keeps dropping names like Werner Herzog. And who else does he drop? You got to do everything yourself, like Casavetes or Rodriguez. And it's like, okay. <laughs> Obviously, you know, the writer's a film fan. So, okay, that's a little self-indulgent. Not, you know, but why not? And then we have the, you know, the character who is just like kind of a drunk green person. And then the person who's constantly worried about everything. They bring some things back like uh, the leprechaun is a cobbler. He's obsessed with his gold. So we have that stuff going on. I liked it all around. It's enjoyable. It's not perfect. It does kind of lose its steam in the middle a little bit, but picks back up. I would recommend checking it out. I think it's pretty fun. It's, you know... It's not bad. It's, 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 you know, and, and I heard it went on sci-fi channel originally. So I was like, Oh no, no. But then I saw the director and I kept hearing positive things and you know, I shouldn't be like that for something like this. It's definitely going to take a lot of positivity behind it for me to check it out because I've been scorned and burned way too many times on these things. And you know, there's just not enough time in the day to watch a lot of bad movies on purpose. So, you know, it was a pleasant surprise and I would recommend checking it out. It was fun. You must be one of the girls. Fixing up the old house way out there from campus. You know about that? Small town. My mom used to live here. She didn't tell you anything about the place where you're going? No. Everything OK? Yeah, everything. We made sure of it. <laughs> You guys really going off grid. By the end of summer, we'll have moved all our electricity to solar and all our water to the well. There's no internet? No internet and no cell service either. 
Hello? I've got a lot of killing to make up for. <laughs> this can't be real. <laughs> Do I look like a figment of imagination to you? I want me gold. Here's the thing my mom always said was real. Her and her friends blew me down the well to rot. There is a deranged dwarf obsessed with money in the kitchen. It's a leprechaun. He would murder anyone for his gold. Why you look so sore? Audiences love lots of gore. I spent last summer stopping poachers from killing sea turtles in Costa Rica. I can handle a bunch of pocket-sized pixies. Okay, the next one is a Patreon pick by my friend Jason Willard, and he picked Reborn. It was I had to import this. It got lost originally, so then I had to wait for another import. Okay, Reborn. This story seems fairly typical of like an 80s or 90s Jean-Claude Van Damme action movie to me. It's like he was in the agency. He left the agency. Now the agency's after him. Tie in a cute little kid that he's taking care of. Yeah. Like, I, I think some people were calling this, like, the um, Asian John Wick. Is this the one they were calling that? But regardless, Reborn follows the story of this uh, guy who has a haunted past. He was pretty much, they called him Ghost. He would kill anything. He was perfect at killing. And he left the agency for some terrible reasons. You find out how it how it is and what, why he left the agency. But regardless, this group of, uh, you know, assassins are after him for a certain reason. And he has this young girl with him that he's trying to protect. You find out who the girl is, who he is, how it ties into the agency all throughout the movie and it's done and there's tons of fighting there's tons of violence the practical fights are great in here i thought they were really cool um although i do like gunplay a little bit more than the fighting but i thought the choreographed stuff was really well done i don't think anybody would argue with that um i think that they add cgi at times with you know some things like splatter and i was like i, I pass on that but i thought the showdowns were what you're looking for and there is a, a emotional core to the movie which i thought worked well the girl in here is a very adorable character in the very beginning i think she finds like a dead cat and she's walking it and she goes and buries it and you're like oh that's so that's so lovely at the same time you know it kind of like you know you know her personality and everything like that like she doesn't care how the people look at her she wants to do the right thing and I guess that's kind of like how the lead character is in this movie as well. There's a really good scene in here, like, uh, and I can you can relate, like, if you ever did something really um, emotionally impactful or just physically and like endurance to ridiculous levels, like he has this brutal fight scene, and then like he sits down and just starts eating, like to eat really quick because he knows he's not gonna have time because he's gonna be in the next fight, but. I enjoyed the bad guys, although they introduced them a little bit. I wish that they were in it just a little bit more, to be honest. Um, I think that they could have added some more bad guy, you know, some detail into the bad guys. The main bad guy, I think the showdown is really good. I think the fights are really good. I think that's the highlight of this movie, and I think it does have an emotional core. But I do believe something like the North Korean movie, The Man from Nowhere, does it better. I think it handles it better with the emotion in here. I felt that I was more attached to that movie. I felt it was more realistic and grounded. But this movie... It's definitely not trying to be grounded or realistic. Um, it's almost like a superhero movie at the same time. Like this. Oh, sorry about that. This guy could be like a Wolverine type character fighting and everything like that. Cause it's, but like, if you want something with good fights and some good locations here and there, and I like the characters that end up coming in and helping them. I think that they probably are even more interesting than the lead character at times. So, and we have this weird element of like, telepathy or telekinesis going on telepathy kind of in here with a character that he owes stuff to that you know he's responsible for all in all i thought it was fairly decent martial arts action movie with uh you know an attempt to be emotional and i think that the emotion works in here i think that it could be a probably a graphic novel or a comic book as well if that makes any sense decent bad guys could have been a little bit better um Sometimes I get a little bored when a bad guy when they're fighting a lot of guys that I don't know who they are. I like to know most of the characters that are getting killed, and there's so many of them, so many just um, you know bodies getting sm slammed and killed and stuff like that. That you know it almost defeats its purpose. But I think it's worth checking out. Um, no features on the DVD on the Blu-ray, which kind of surprised me. I don't know if they're all on the DVD, but it didn't look like it, which kind of blew my mind. Um, but yeah, I. I so I, I would check this one out if it, uh, you're interested in that. I think the director did, it says here, I know this director did some other things like as well, but um, maybe he did verses or the lead actors in verses. But, you know, uh, I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, the, the anybody in this movie, actually, unless I would read it, you know, then I might be like, okay, okay, okay. But I think it's worth checking out.
英雄が歴史の教科書に出てくるような姿をしているとは限らない世界が混沌を迎える時まるでそれを待つようにして英雄が生まれる君はおとぎ話は好きだ伝説のリボーン同士ともその一つだ話を本気で信じてるわけじゃない。Hey guys, what's up? It is、uh, week eight of Hammer Time. There we go, fake hammer. <laughs> And we're covering、uh, Shadow of the Cat. This one,、uh, it's funny because it was made in 1961. And it went back to black and white. It was made after Curse of the World, around the same time. I think they were actually like, being made around the same time. And some weird kind of thing popped up where they couldn't call it a Hammer movie officially. So it wasn't a Hammer movie on like, paper or in certain productions or something like that. But for all intents and purposes, it is a Hammer movie. And that's super weird about the movie, like the history. It's on the DVD and everything. But she had to look at 1961. Definitely a Poe inspired story. Like,、oh, right, yeah. when, right when I put it in, I was like, Okay, it looks a little cheaper than Curse of the Werewolf, which was probably one of their biggest budget ones. They probably were doing two at a time, and they're like, we'll do one expensive, one cheap, and if you know, one fails, we'll be a little, you know what I mean?、Right. Kind of do that a lot. But it has some familiar faces in here.、Uh, the director actually did, went on to do a few more Hammer movies. He, did the, he does The Mummy Shroud, The Reptile, and Plague of the Zombies, none of which I've seen, which I'm excited for, all of them. And it stars the guy who played Watson. From、uh, Hound of Baskersville, and he's, he's a pretty popular British actor. And it also stars、uh, the kind of evil maid from Brides of Dracula in here, and she also has a great role.、Mm -hmm. So, do you want to give the plot on this one, or you want me to give the plot?、Um, well, like you said, it is Poe inspired. Okay, so. I mean, it opens with an old lady just reading The Raven for no real reason.、Uh, there's part of is it the Black Cat?、Um, Telltale Heart, kind of. Not right. I thought it was going to be the Telltale Heart by the way it was going, but it sort of is with a body hidden. There's a bo hidden body. There's、It's、a hidden body. And... Super gothic. It's definitely one of those movies like, we need the will, the lost will in this big ha haunted house with deceitive, like, deceitful family members. That to me is like the definition of gothic. It's like,、right. if there's a freaking will in your movie, it's just gothic. Well, the house, the house isn't haunted. It's just everybody's paranoid because we know they did something wrong. Well, it is. And that cat's going to rat him out. <laughs> It's funny. Okay. <laughs> An old lady is very mean spiritedly murdered in the opening. It's not like graphic, but I felt bad. Like,、yeah. by a, couple, a butler, a maid, and her husband. And that's right in the beginning. No real spoilers. So then there, she owns a cat that she loves. You know, it reminded me of the Uncanny, kind of that story that was in the anthology with、um, the guy who planted with、uh, Will and the killer cat. But, so she's murdered, the body's hidden, and they want to collect on her will. So that's basically. So they're, they're after this cat because they believe that the cat's seen it and can identify him, which is ridiculous. Then they,、uh, the, the daughter or the niece comes in and she is, knows something's up. She's like the goody two shoes of the family. 
And then the the brother calls in his uh, not the husband calls in his brother and his um, son and nephew his and yeah. and um, her his uh, wife and they're really deceitful and they basically want to kill this cat to get part of the will. That's kind of the story. I love that the guy who plays the mean husband, he's such a prick. Right away, I was like, I want him dead now. He's right. yelling at everyone. He's so harsh. And I, it was so funny because he's the complete opposite of how he played Watson. Right, yeah. So that was nice to see. Um, I You know, th- this one's in black and white, but a movie being in black and white doesn't really bother me. No, and if a black and white movie bothers you, then you probably should get your, you know, like, head examined. Right. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm just saying you're not really like a big cinephile if you hate black and white movies or and anything it's, like that. It's I'm real... not saying I'm like a huge... I, I, I would say I'm a cinephile, but it's just weird that people are so like, I hate black and white. It's like, okay, whatever. Well, it's just weird though, because like, I'll, I'll see a movie in black and white, and then like I'll go to like think on it, and I'm like, I don't remember it being in black and white. Maybe it was. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I always remember, because they, they definitely like play with the lighting and a lot, and it works well with like mm-hmm. gothic and uh, like that kind of haunted thriller like tones, because they can oh, use their shadows and stuff like that. Oh, it does. Th- yeah. it, this one does become an kind of like accidentally comical to me only because a plot of any movie with like an evil cat makes me laugh right off the bat i just I, it's not like a this is stupid it's kind of like a giddiness where i'm like oh what's that cat gonna do it's like right. and they're just like it's like these grown men and women looking at this cat like oh no and it's just it's just a cat and it's always a different cat in each yeah. shot too. It's just like, because yeah. well that's our mean cat that's our fast cat right. and that's our cute cat so you know they got multiple cats and oh, of course, there is the classic hammer swamp in here. Yeah, there is and, a swamp. And someone actually dies by <laughs> swamp here. Because, I mean, how many ways can a, a uh, I mean, there's many ways to skin a cat, but how many ways can a cat take out a person, right? Right. So it's got to kind of lure them in. But it, it's actually really funny, and there's some people being, like, trainering each other to, for this will. It's a, it's a very typical story. But not for a Hammer movie, because like I, I, they uh, mentioned that in special features too. Right when I put this on, I was like, man, this is very Poe-like. Right when I see yeah. anything with a cat, I think Poe. But um, uh, anything horror-centric or horror kind of related and Poe and a cat, I think Poe. Right. So I, I'm watching this, and I'm like, this is very Poe-like. And they say that right in the special features, which I was like, ah... And I didn't really know for like this one always had me nervous. Like I always double checked before I watched. It. I was like, is this a Hammer one? Is this a Hammer one? This is one of those. But it's listed as a Hammer film, and they explain the history of it, which is an interesting kind of deal too. Well, I mean, you know, it does have two actors from prior Hammer films, and the director, and the director. Um, it's in line with what Hammer was creating at the time. Yeah. Granted, yeah. it's Poe influence, but it's still... Um, yeah, yeah. You know, like, if you were... If you didn't know that it wasn't a Hammer movie, you would still think it was a Hammer movie. I, I would think. Yeah, yeah, probably. You, you, If somebody told you it wasn't a Hammer movie or a Hammer movie, you would believe it either you, way. Yeah, you would believe yeah, it either yeah. way. So, um, I really like this one. I thought it was funny. I thought it was super fast-paced. It's only like an hour and 15 minutes or something. 75 minutes, which I love for this kind yeah, of movie. perfect length. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it like it, it opens good and, and it just keeps going. There isn't any downtime. No downtime. And uh, the acting's top-notch. The cat mm-hmm. picks off the right people in the right ways. Some people do some stupid things. But, I mean, you gotta... Yeah, there like, are some frustrating <laughs> moments. Well, the guy gets on the roof. What the hell is he doing? My, mine is when the actual... When... When the guy gets the thing in the bag and... and oh, that moron. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I'm just like, come on, At really? one point, they actually trap the cat. Kind of slight spoilers. They yeah. get it in a live trap, and they decide to take the cat out of the trap and put it in a bag to drown it. And, you know, I may, call me a monster, but just throw the whole cage in the swamp. Just like, <laughs> you know, it, it. you managed to get into the bag. Okay. Whack it against the wall. I mean, it's a cat. And I just I, this guy it's has a this cage. Like, just elaborate throw, like James Bond torture setup that he off in the swamp somewhere. He's going to fucking do and just throw the whole cage in the swamp. Yeah, it's yeah. over. I mean, it's cruel. There, I don't know why people decided to always drown cats. Like I'm gonna <laughs> like I don't like back in the day. You always get that people that are like drown. Like it, it happens in um Inferno where the guy's just drowning cats. It's like why are you people drowning cats? Like you're you're sick. Like if you really mm-hmm. if if you're killing animals. Just shoot them. Yeah. Like, I know it's not any, like, it's gross, too, and horrible to be killing, like, you're not supposed to be shooting stray cats, and this is not, cat's not even a stray, it's a pet, but mm-hmm. it's it's supernatural. It definitely is supernatural, but still, like, the point is, it's like, why are you drowning these animals, saving money, you're that cheap, like, mm-hmm. you gotta grab them, and it's just, I don't even know what's wrong with people, to be no. honest, I don't know where that started. Well, they were related, what, to witches, at points? 
Yeah, probably. I don't, so, I don't to drown them? I don't know. Regardless, people I think drowning is the least messiest. And cheapest. And probably cheapest. Yeah. Or hitting against the wall. But if, the, if you can get close enough to put them in a bag, then they're probably not, like, feral. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't on know. I don't, I don't know. I'm not an expert on We're not going to discuss execution of cats yeah, anymore. So. But uh, I love the cat in the movie. The mm-hmm. lead is very sweet and nice, and it's kind of obvious what's going to happen at the end of the movie. But it never stops you. It never deters you from enjoyment. It's always enjoyable. The uh, the maid, she has. She was the maid in the she Bride was, of Dracula. She's the evil, uh, you know, like Renfield type of Brides of Dracula. Right. She's great in that, and she's great in this, too. She's great. She, she, she also has just a fun total breakdown like she does in uh, Dracula. So I was enjoying her. Also perishes the same way. <laughs> she falls. She, she, she has a terrible fall yeah, down the stairs. <laughs> but you know what's funny is like you see like I guess these actors were really pretty much a lot of these actors and actresses in this movie were well respected people and mm-hmm. you get to watch them be terrified of a house cat. Yeah. Like there's the cat and it's like <laughs> eyes glow at times. You're like Oh, God, stop. I mean, like, this story would be used later on in kind of like the Tales from the Dark Side storyline of um, mm-hmm. the one with William Hickey. And, and remember that? You ever see Tales from the Dark Side? Well, there's one with no, the but cat. I don't know who William Hickey is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, it's it's nothing nobody's not seen before. Evil cats, you know, the black cat story. But yeah. it's super enjoyable. I actually, I really, really like this one. I, I can't. It's one of my favorite ones, believe it or not. Maybe it's because it's a change of pace, and to know that it was made with the Curse of the Werewolf is really cool at the same time because you have like the more lavish, expensive one, and then you have like this cheap one that's just like really well made and well acted at the same time. So you know, I'd really recommend this one. Unfortunately, um, Creature Features and Tear on Tape did not have a review for Shadow of the Cat. Uh, This I have a UK DVD. I don't think it's ever been put on Blu-ray. I don't know if it will. Um, but the DVD looked pretty good and it had some special features on there. So I think this one's probably kind of like, uh, you know, uh, underrated or underseen one for sure. When it comes to hammer movies, I would, uh, recommend checking this one out for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, short, fun. There's no surprises in this, but it's enjoyable nonetheless. Cause like, I guess you know what's going to happen and I think you get to roll with that. You get to enjoy it. Just a well-made gothic thriller about an evil cat and evil... No, not even evil cat. The cat's cat. not even evil. Just a revengeful cat picking off evil Man relatives. is the real monster. Okay, we get it, we get it, we get it. Um, I would rate this probably... Um, what would I give this one? Um, four out of five. I want to give it four out of five. I'll go 7.75 out of ten. You? Four out of five. Eight out of ten. Eight you. out of no. Four out of five. Eight out of ten. We need a ten. No. Five. We need it to di- <laughs> Okay. Eh. Average. Hey. What are you gonna start? Pretty soon it's gonna be on a scale of three. Dustin Mills scale here. <laughs> what the, is it? The three stars. It's like it's one. It's like one. Didn't like it. Two. Like it. Three. Really like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's really all you need. I ain't trying to. Yeah. Okay. I um, hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll post what's uh, going to be next week right here. But uh, let's roll that trailer to Shadow of uh, the Shadow of the Cat. Is it Gorgon's head? No, that's for a while. Huh? Two big new thrillers in one spine-tingling show. Thriller number one, The Curse of the Werewolf. Half man, half wolf. His beast blood demanded that he kill, even as his human soul cried out for love. You say you love me, but will you marry me? Yes. Yes, I will. But under the full moon, the dream of love became a nightmare. Get away! Get away! Get away! Plus, the shadow of the cat. One cat, nine lives. Walter, Clara, Andrew, Beth, Michael, Jacob, Edgar, Louise, Ella. Nine lives on the edge of terror. Was it supernatural force or psychotic compulsion? Terrific together. The Curse of the Werewolf in color and The Shadow of the Cat at your theater only. Okay, uh, let's get into the questions. James Grimmer, what did you enjoy most about working on Nutsack? That sounds so funny, right? I was in a movie by James Bell, uh, a short, um, it's maybe like 40 minutes or something, called Nutsack, and I went down and 
it was in Detroit, um, and that's not too far from me. So I went down there. Um, the most thing I enjoyed about working on Nutsack was that James Bell is, you know, guerrilla style. It's like, hey, let's just go film here and do it and make it fast and crazy. And and we were on this uh, uh, factory. We were at this factory on the outside, like this old building, not a factory. And this guy came by, and we were like, oh, no, we're getting shut down. And he said, hey, what are you guys doing? And he's like, well, we're making a movie. We're getting ready to leave now. And he was like, you guys want in? And he just let us in this old like building. He was going to turn into a creative commons and it was really scary and creepy in there. And we shot some stuff in there. So, uh, the spur of the moment kind of, you know, guerrilla filmmaking I enjoy. And James and his wife are really cool. They're easy to work with and everything like that. So not, nothing like too, you know, grueling and they do intense stuff, but they didn't ask me to do anything too intense. Not that I wouldn't have, but you know, they didn't ask me to do anything super crazy. Nick Mua, how would you defend your movie collection from a, a zealot who wants to burn sinful materials like they did book burnings in the late Middle Ages? I, I wouldn't even respond to them. If they came to my house with a torch and said, I'm burning your movies, I'd be like, get out of my house before I kill you. But if it was like a whole cultural change and everybody wanted to get rid of cinema and art and everything like that, I tell them, what's next? If you don't like, you know, a splatter movie or a comedy or something that is offensive to you, what's next? There's so many things you could say. You could say those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Though, if you start to censor certain things before you know it, people that don't like peanuts or people that don't like chicken wings or people that don't like the color green, all of a sudden everything's censored and you have nothing. It, it's just what makes us different. There's a million reasons not to censor anything. And sometimes people like to watch scary movies or horrible things in movies so they, you know, can feel better about their lives. There's a million reasons people watch movies. There's a million reasons why people be interested in things. There's a thousand reasons you could tell somebody that. It's none of their business anyways to tell you what to do with your life or what you watch. Uh, again, unless it's, you know, uh, hurting someone and, you know, a movie, a horror movie or a comedy or an action or a Western. It's not hurting anybody. It's just a movie, you know? Uh, okay, I was. he has another question. I was watching the recent Star Trek movies again. They take place in an alternate dimension, I guess. What Would you want to meet yourself from an alter di alternate dimension if possible? I don't think so. Not at this point. You know, five years ago, yes. No, at this point, I'd be like, oh, what if they're doing way better than me? And then I would just feel horrible. I'd be like, that could have been me. But I'm me, and I'm not him, you know? Or maybe, maybe if they're doing worse than me, I'd be like, whew. But then I wouldn't want to see myself in a worse situation. I don't know. I just think, no, no. I don't know. Uh, Sorgan Valentine Prang, a.k.a. Dr. Snuff. I forgot to ask you about Jackass, both the series and the movies. Did you ever watch it? And if you did, did you like it? Ooh, uh, I used to watch, you know, CKY. I've seen a couple of those in the series occasionally. Uh, the movies I've seen, I've seen here and there. Sometimes they're funny to me. Sometimes they're just not funny. The stuff that kind of makes me laugh back in the day was when they would like sneak a dog turd in and then argue with a restaurant owner that said, what is this? Why is this on my plate? And they're like, that's a chive. I'm like you eat it then. It's not a chive. That kind of stuff makes me laugh. But when they're just hitting each other in the nuts with staplers, I'm like, okay. You've seen it once. Okay, whatever. And if they're doing it on purpose, it's just not that funny. I don't know. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's not. I, I'm iffy, and iffy on it. Sometimes I really laughed, and other times I would just roll my eyes. Okay, answers. I asked everybody what the last 10 out of 10 movie they saw was. William Wolford, the last 10 out of 10 I saw was Triple Nine. Favorite scary movie? I think the last 10 out of 10 movie I watched was Brian De Palma Scarface. I'd never seen it until last fall when it was released to theaters, re-released to theaters in the 35th anniversary. I've heard so much good stuff about it over the years that I didn't expect it to live up to the hype, but I was really surprised at how stylish it was and how much I enjoyed it. You know what? The thing about Scarface was I really liked it when I saw it years ago, and then like the fan base. I have really tr I, I'm really bad about fan bases ruining movies for me, and I shouldn't be like that. That's very dumb. But the fan base was so annoying for that five years ago that I was like, eh, it's overrated, it's overrated. And you know what? No, I don't think it is. I get it. If I rewatch it, I'm like, oh, it's a great movie. I really like that movie. You know, I don't have to take into consideration everybody's favorite movie, Scarface, seems like an asshole. Even though that's a blanket statement and it's not true. But, you know, for a while it did feel like that. Dead Flintstone. I had another look at the 70s Rollerball movie. It's full marks for me, one of the great of, greats of its decade. I still need to watch the original Rollerball. I think my pops like that movie. James Grimmer, the last five-star movie I watched was Deep Cover. I thought Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldman were great in it, and I found it to be enthralling overall. I need to watch that movie. I've wanted to see it for years. Chris Rivers, the last perfect film I watched was The Phantom Carriage, an absolute masterpiece. That one I need to watch for sure, too. Jonathan Wilhelm, last five out of uh, out of movie. Last five out of five movie for me was Hereditary. Jordan Peele's Us and Hagazuza might be close to five out of five. Just need a rewatch. This one is very long, and... Um, 
I think there might be a uh, translation, you know, uh, you know, air. So uh, Sorgen, uh, Dr. Snuff writes, it rarely happens that I watch a movie I would call a, five, a, a classic or a five out of five movie. They only come by once or twice a year. I guess it comes down to personal criteria for rating a movie. Also, a movie can be, sorry, also a movie can be a classic without having scored the highest grade in my book. That is if the movie has some historical importance or something like that. I agree. A good example would be Psycho by Hitchcock. Personally, I would not rate Psycho as being a 5 out of 5 movie, but I would still regard it as a classic because of its historical importance. So in my book, there is clear distinction between getting the highest score and then being a classic. Anyway, the last 5 out of 5 movie I watched was a local Danish movie called Sons of Denmark, directed by Ulus, I'm not going to pronounce his name, 2019. The movie managed to capture the current state of both the political situation in Denmark and Danish society as a whole. Essentially, the movie plays out as if a what-if scenario where everything goes as wrong as one could possibly imagine. I went to watch it in the cinema with a friend, and after the movie was over, no one left their seats. Everyone just kept sitting in their seats quietly trying to pro uh, process what they had just seen. You could virtually hear a needle drop. It says a lot about the impact of the movie made both on me and the rest of the audience because I have never experienced that before. The story is so well constructed with a neat plot twist, the acting is top notch, the camera work slash editing is efficient, and the climax is mind blowing. And of course, the movie has sparked some debates and controversies. But the funny thing is that even though I hold the movie in high esteem, I am not sure I would regard it as a classic of Danish cinema, simply because I'm afraid it would feel extremely outdated five years from now because the society would have changed and therefore unable to relate to the movie. It is also the reason why I would not recommend it to people from outside Denmark. They would not be able to understand the context of the movie. In that way, you can call it a very culture-specific movie. Anyway, I hope that the movie will go get some recognition by winning some awards and maybe be the Danish contribution as best foreign film in next year's Oscar show. Thank you for reading my extremely long post. No problem. Um, that is very interesting, and I like that you said that I would not recommend because I watched that movie, the Rasputin movie, and I was like, I don't understand Russian politics from World War II, so... I mean, I can grasp it, but I can't fully comprehend it at the same time. And it was a Russian film about Rasputin, nearly three hours long. And I do think that there's a lot of films like that, where like if you watch like a lot of the old Italian movies that involve politics, even even the Polizia Tetsi movies involve politics. And when somebody would say conservative or fascist or liberal, here is not necessarily the same somewhere else if that makes sense to anybody. So it changes completely in context and everything like that. So it can be very complicated. But thanks for sharing. Uh, Professor Scraggly. The last perfect movie I watched was A Cure for Wellness. The movie seemed to get a lot of hate, but I love the surreal uh, medical experiment angle. It was surprising to see such a strange concept get such good actors and a large budget. You know what? I gave that a lower rating than I should have, and every time I think about the movie, I'm like, that was such a good movie. That was way, way better made than I expect and everything. I think you're right. I think that is due for a rewatch, even though it's so long. But I'd like to watch it with somebody who hadn't seen it and see their initial thoughts. Tahoe Timmy, I did uh, Like Us, gave it a 10. Okay, need to see that. Nick Mua, 5 out of 5, I think you recommended Burnt Offering some time ago. I really dug that one. Top-notch cast, creepy atmosphere, memorable score, strong message, and timeless. This film showed the dark and horrible side of the American dream. And uh, he basically wants to talk about some more regional horror. Uh, so he says, I also quite enjoyed Brian O'Malley's Late Let Us Pray. Finally, Anna, uh, I'm terrible with names. The uh, Western, A Girl Walks Home Alone at, at Midnight. Or is it night? So visually captivating, quite sad. He actually gave uh, her name, which is my terrible pronunciation skills I'm not going to do. And then he wanted to talk about some rock and roll movies, which was a week even previous. To the 90s aren't always remembered finally, with, with good reason in a lot of cases, uh, i.e. Batman and Robin, gangster rap, can't decide which is worse. Oh, shots fired. I always loved the rock films Detroit Rock City. I adore Lead Shade. And Airheads, Buscemi and Frazier together equals comedy gold. And the music is excellent, too, of course. Okay, some other rock and roll movies he wanted to talk about. The question of the week here. I, I don't know if I've asked this one before, but I want to know, have you ever realized slash felt crazy for being a cinephile? Um, have you ever realized that you are not like other people or felt crazy or got yourself in trouble being a cinephile, whether it is you ordered a bunch of movies, stayed up super late watching movies and go to work, or have you ever been talking to someone or like about movies and then you realize this person has no, does not care what I'm talking about, doesn't understand a word I'm talking about, looking at me like I'm insane and definitely dislikes me now. And have has ever has been being a cinephile ever got you in trouble okay or you know left a negative impact on your life that's what i want to kind of ask so i guess we're gonna hop into the update okay guys we're gonna hop into this update first starting off with a bang uh fred decker's night of the creeps the scream factory release i love this movie good news is your dates are here the bad news is they're dead 
He's dead. Okay, that's not that what he says in the movie. But man, I love this movie. Always love this movie. One of my all time favorites. Tom Atkins, man, love it. Let's see. We got new interviews with actor Alan Kayser, Ken Heron, Susan Snyder, and more. We got new episode of Horse Hollowed Grounds, and then it looks like the, all the other stuff on here. We got the director's cut and theatrical version on here. You know, is this not re a new remaster? I don't know. Regardless, love this movie. Can't get enough. Had to have the special edition. We have some Vinegar Syndrome. We have Night Owl. I've not seen this one. Nice little slip cover. Um, don't know much about it. Is this the one directed by John Leguizamo? Uh, but regardless, yeah, looks interesting. I actually really love Vinegar Syndrome, like I said. Probably one of my favorite labels. I pretty much pick up all their Blu-rays. I actually do pick up all their Blu-rays, not pretty much. Then we have The Passing. Ooh. This whole this whole month, like, I didn't know much about any of these movies. Usually there's one in there that I'm kind of familiar with. And this whole thing, I did not know anything about any of four of these movies. So I should definitely check out a couple of these when I get a chance. Then we have uh, Taking Tiger Mountain. This is like Bill Paxton's first directed movie. Looks interesting, for sure. R.I.P. Bill Paxton. Shame. Shame. He was a great actor. Had a lot of a lot of screen presence, charisma. Always enjoyed him. Then we have uh, Putney Swoop, the Truth and Soul movie. Yeah, this sounds really strange. In fact, all four of these movies are probably the weirdest month that uh, Vinegar Syndrome's done. Again, I don't have, I don't know much about any of these movies, which rarely happens with Vinegar Syndrome. I at least know one. All right. Then we have uh, Commando Director's Cut Schwarzenegger. This is an import. I love Commando. Love Mark Lester. Love Arnold Schwarzenegger, as you guys know. I just did that uh, Total Recall commentary. If you guys want to check it out on Patreon. Oh, it's not Patreon, but it's on my, uh, you know. Um, uh, podcast feed. So there we go. Commando classic. Then we got the Chucky collection. Couldn't pass this up. Great price. I have the Anchor Bay. I mean, not Anchor Bay. Geez, the Scream Factory released the first one and uh, all these on DVD. But why not? The Blu ray was 20 bucks. Get all seven uh, Child's Play movies. Not seen the new one, of course, the remake. But yep. I've always enjoyed the ones I've seen. I've seen only the first four, to be honest. You know, I'm, like I said, I'm not one who always watches every sequel. Then we have this bad boy right here, The Devil's Machine. This is a new one from Laurie Brewster. He did The Owl Man and uh, Lord, Lords of Tears. That's what it was called. And some other films, too. I have The Unkindness of Ravens. I need to watch all his movies, but they're really deluxe, nice additions. And I'm interested in checking that one out for sure. And then we have a DVD of Uncommon Valor which I wanted to watch because I just watched Rebel War. I was like, I want more Red Brown. Uh, Tex Cobb's in this. Gene Hackman, Treat Williams, Fred Ward. This movie I actually remember really digging, so it's been a while since I've seen it, but it's kind of like... It's the same plot of that movie, Let's Get Harry, where uh, this guy's son's trapped in Vietnam, and he's like, I'm going, I'm getting a team, and we're going to get him out of there. But yeah, I guess we're going to hop back to the video. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. As always, you guys have a good one. Eh!